March 27, 2011. Dear family and friends, Yesterday, I went with a former student to volunteer at Amai Sensei's program for the homeless and evacuees. It had snowed the night before, so it was cold and very windy. But everyone arrived at the park on time. We were there to serve food and hand out clothing. For the homeless, this has been an ongoing haven for several years. But for the evacuees, it's still something rather new. Since this program has been going on for a while, the people involved were very organized. Homeless men had been congregating for hours before a small truck arrived filled with supplies. Each man had a special task assigned to him, so the process of unloading the truck, putting down big blue mats, sorting used and donated clothes, and preparing the food tables went surprisingly smoothly. In fact, it ran like clockwork. That day, hot bean curry over white rice was the menu. The grateful homeless men and evacuees, some of them children, lined up and patiently waited their turn to be served. There was no pushing or shoving, no yelling or rudeness. Rather, everyone waited in quiet humility for the warm, filling meal they were about to receive. Then they scattered to available places in the sun, protected from the wind, to enjoy their food. Many went back for seconds and thirds. After that nourishing meal was over, everyone again lined up to receive donated cup noodles, packaged rice porridge, and hokaro, which are small heating packs that do wonders against the cold. Again, people were very gracious and very grateful. One of my favorite graphic art pieces is the one by Fritz Fitchenberg called Christ of the Breadline. It depicts a line of men, heads bent down, hands folded, shoulders stooping from the weight of endurance in the face of ongoing poverty. Yesterday, I saw people exactly like that. Everyone had on shabby clothes. Some had no front teeth. No one's hair had been washed or combed. Yet for me, there was something much more, much deeper. Every one of those souls lined up seemed to have an inner beauty that glowed out of and around them. They seemed shy, deeply humble, and grateful for a chance to be recognized as worthy human beings. Later, an old man went to sort through the donated clothing. He was next to me as he bent over trying to find a sweater. I turned and looked at him and was reminded of my own aged father. I wondered how I would feel if my parent were the one looking through a pile of old clothes in a park on a cold spring day. I was so touched by that old, slow-moving gentleman that I almost cried, but I didn't. Instead, I helped him select a nice black turtleneck and then assisted him in getting it on. He bowed deeply, and then his son came, and together they walked away. I wish I could say I saw only beauty as I volunteered, but there were vultures there too. Some were middle-aged people, rather well-dressed, who would rather get free food than stand in long lines waiting to be let into supermarkets. One such that I found particularly offensive was a young, newly married couple who were there with the sole purpose of snatching whatever they could. They headed right for the hot food, then went round and round collecting other handouts. They had so many things that they needed a huge box to carry them all. I was furious, and when they sneaked round to where I was to get even more handouts, I shouted at them and told them to get out of there the Japanese volunteers had contended with the middle-aged thieves. Are you homeless? Are you in a shelter? If not, then please wait until everyone else has had their turn. But I find that when I am angry, my American directness comes roaring to the fore like a raging dragon, and that is exactly how I behaved that day towards the young couple who brought shame to so many Japanese. Later, I apologize to the other volunteers, but even now, 
I feel indignation and disgust towards those two. They left gloating over all they had gotten for free. It saddens me all the more when I realize that the terrible tragedy all around seems to have completely missed them. They seem to be as superficial and as selfish as if nothing has ever happened. But I will not let small snags like that get in the way of a larger version, which I wish to see and to hold in my heart forever. There are now many TV programs showing work being done in shelters. Many concerts are being held, not only for charity, but also for the evacuees themselves. Sendai Philharmonic Orchestra recently held a concert in a shelter. The sickness people complain of now are mainly of the emotions, one doctor said, and music will soothe their minds for a while. And along a similar vein, school children in some shelters are forming choruses and singing in the evenings, Everyone longs for those moments of beauty, anything to give them courage to face another day. Work on cleaning up is getting underway. Many in shelters are going to their former workplaces and starting to scrape up thick, oily black mud from the floors and shelves. Others are sorting through the remains of their homes and offices to see what can be salvaged and to, to future use. One delighted man found his computer with all his company data on it, still intact. Another young man said that even though he had a chance to go to college, he could not leave the people of his town. He would stay there and help them clean up and pull themselves together from scratch. This is where I belong. This is the work I am meant to be doing. Impressively, we watched one small factory owner return to his destroyed plant, gather all his employees and give them a long speech. First, he told them he was grateful that they were all alive. Then, he thanked each and every one of them for all their years of service. From there, he told them he could not pay them because he had lost everything. But if they would help him, he would do his very best to get his company up and running again. And then, they would have jobs once more. The men were so beautifully Japanese they all stood in rows before him, heads bowed, hands clasped. They listened in silence and respect, knowing their boss was trying to help them to the best of his ability. Later, the boss, once a wealthy member of the town, went to the bank to humbly ask for a loan to start all over again. Story like these are appearing more and more, of course, there is still much grieving, much shock, much uncertainty, but ever so slowly, too, people are starting to pick up the pieces and move forward. Even the emperor, who by tradition stays detached from the people, sent huge boxes of food and 1,000 special eggs that are normally eaten only by the royal family. People say that was a sign of how serious this situation is, which of course is true. But I like to think that it might also mean that the current emperor is sensitive enough to allow the most rigid social barriers to give way to compassion and the most profound depths of his own human heart. Love, Anne. May 17th, 2011. Dear family and friends, it has been well over a month since I have been in touch. Much has happened in that time both in Japan and in my own personal life. Of course, the world's attention has mostly sifted away from the disasters here, but even so, there is a lot still going on. Almost everyone is intensely focused on remaking their lives. Those who are seriously hit have had to start almost from scratch, but even those who have suffered little physical loss are trying to reassess their attitudes, values, and ways of being in the world. This week, traditionally, people travel for enjoyment, very often overseas. But this year, most people from this area feel a need to stay close to their roots, or they are too busy sorting out their personal lives. So instead of going to other places, the big trend now is to volunteer. 
Sendai Station has a booth with a list of places needing volunteer services. No matter what people's specialty, everyone wants to contribute in some way. The sense of drive and of purpose is palpable everywhere. One young woman friend loves to make cakes, so she has been making almost 700 bean cupcakes on her days off and has delivered them to evacuation centers where there are still hundreds of people waiting their turn to get a temporary home. Sports are really big now too. They provide an energetic diversion from tragedy and also promote a sense of team spirit and working together for success. There have been several baseball games in the past few weeks. Usually Sendai's team plays with great elan, but always loses. This past week, however, it has been winning every game to the cheers of the astonished and the delighted crowd. A friend who lives in hard-hit Natori came to Sendai to help me with changing legal documents after my move. Previously, she had volunteered for two days in evacuation shelters where her job was to register people. But after hearing story after story of dead or missing relatives and not knowing what to say or how to comfort the victims, she realized the sort of work was too emotionally overwhelming even for her. So for her, as for many, this upheaval has created a time of deep soul searching and wonder. I have found a similar attitude in my own life. One small way to honor my desire to be attentive was that I did not turn on music. I love catching up on reading or listen to the news as I would normally do. And I found those activities too intrusive and inappropriate. So I have spent days in silence with only the sound of birds, wind, and rain, with only the prismatic sunlight that graciously illuminates these rooms, with only an inner attunement of how to arrange this new home to reflect the person I am now. It has been an exhausting but very sacred time for me. It's especially hard on the old, of course, but small children find it very confusing too, especially if they have lost one parent or even both. Some youngsters have been relocated very far from this area. However, and unfortunately, sometimes, their new classmates will bully them saying, you have radiation cooties. We don't want you here. Many of those youngsters also lost parents, so know the terrible consequences of this sort of natural disaster. In one shelter, all the children from both Kobe and Tohoku held hands making a circle. They swayed and sang together, giving each other love and understanding. All these are little steps that hopefully someday will bring about an all-encompassing level of healing. Other work of volunteers, adults, is to sort through the debris and collect various items of importance. A picture album here, a bracelet there, a shoulder bag, or even a fragile bowl, all the little things that make up ordinary daily life. Then they take these precious items to a central area where the evacuees can sort through them and hopefully find something that is theirs and that holds a universe of memories, little acts of kindness stemming directly from the heart can make such a world of difference. Everyone knows the Sakura, the cherry blossom, is Japan's flower. But did you know that the blue-black screeching forceful crow is her bird? I was totally amazed when I learned that curious fact. But when I thought about it, I could catch a wider understanding of the Japanese psychological and emotional makeup. At the real, very short-lived delicacy on the one side and strong focus, tenacious determination on the other. People here try to live balancing an attitude that honors those extremely divergent dimensions and everything in between. The Japanese are masters at temporarily diverting their attention away from their problems in order to appreciate a moment of beauty or even a moment of pleasure. That seems to sum up much of what is happening here now. 
Most Japanese who are currently facing a life filled with sorrow and loss also have a tremendous sense of unfinished work. I want to rebuild not for myself, but for the children. That forward-looking attitude, so much larger than oneself, is a motivating factor uniting us all. Love, Anne.